Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Beyond the Track with Daniel Blair. I expect this episode to be a really fun one because I really like the guy on the other end of this line. Tony Alessi, welcome to the show. Thanks, Daniel. Glad to be part of it. Tony, we've had so many good interviews in the past. Just, uh, you know, part of Supercross or on my podcast. It's always a good conversation with you. And uh, this one's going to be a little bit different, though, because we're going beyond the track. You know, we're going to talk some racing stuff, but I do want to talk about things away from racing, too. And I have to imagine right now you're, I mean, you're in the semi truck. It's Sunday after the first race. I know you're probably in there working because you just, that's what you do. But tell me, there's some, Tony time beyond the track that you've had been able to have today at all? Have you, have you had any time for yourself or is it right back to it? Well, Tony time right now, it kind of involves, uh, you know, my wife is getting ready to have her fourth girl, which is our together fourth girl. So we had to do a couple hours of that going on because uh, she's in a window of about two and a half weeks of uh, giving birth, which would, it's going to be tricky for that indie, right? Uh, and uh, so, yeah, that was Tony time this morning going over that whole schedule and trying to figure out um you know how to how to how to do the logistics of that what are you gonna do <laughs> well i figured something out to be honest with you i figured out a way to tie it together you know i'm planning on shane who uh, obviously uh had a shoulder injury i'm i kind of planning on him starting to ride february 1 right with the intent to be back hopefully by orlando which is i believe february 13th so I figured I could just figure out how to work with him during that like week or so period where we got the window and get him kind of back in the groove, back going. I know that we didn't finish testing with his bike. So um, I think I can kind of coordinate that to where I'm within a couple hours of, of the house and I'm still being productive, you know, obviously helping Shane and I'm close to the house. So it's kind of a, a win-win. It looks like I'll miss a race though. Tony, you you blow me away, man. You not only with the kids, you're having more kids. Your team is huge. Like, are you just like the master of managing like a lot of people? Because <laughs> whether it's personal life or racing, there you have a lot to deal with, and somehow you do it. It seems to come pretty easily, to be honest, and it's enjoyable. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different personalities to work with, and there's a lot of different ups and downs and things that are going on but uh for the most part yeah i mean we've got a lot of people right we've got four riders which also means there's four mechanics and uh so it's a big crew and um like you said i got i got a crew at home going on going on girl number four you know so yeah it's busy you know i i'm amazed again by your team you said the amount of riders the amount of mechanics but i've seen your program up close i've gone to dinner with you guys i'm sorry i missed the last one but tony don't don't cut me out of the invite. I want to come. I just couldn't do the first one. Okay, well, let's do, let's do the Friday one. Let's do it. It's done. But I'm, I'll let everybody know that all my okay. responsibilities are on mute because I got to go to dinner with Tony and the team. But the one thing I've noticed about you, again, is the organization and how you do things. Even from when Mike was racing as a kid, you know, just the journal and keeping. Is that kind of what's always worked for you and making sure that you're able to handle all these responsibilities? Is, is you have a system for organization and filing? I mean, is that what contributes to this i mean you know there there's a lot to keep track of right i mean it's not just oh a rider and and there's a lot going on right there you know there's a lot going on with the bike there's a lot going off the settings you can't you gotta you gotta keep track of everything because i mean you're aware you're a rider i mean if you miss something up by three clicks up the bike don't work and it's like what happened you know so obviously you got to have a, a really good reference point for all of that stuff and um so yeah, I mean, we keep track of everything and, and uh, I mean, organization is a big part of it, you know, keeping it organized. You got a good crew though, right? You, I mean, your mechanics and everybody, it, it, when I was at the Madera Supercross with you guys, it just, it looks like you got a good team together. I know from you, from a management perspective, I mean, if you don't have the right people in, the, in, uh, in place, it's going to be a messy situation all the time. So are you pretty happy with the guys that you have and their knowledge and their understanding of how you work? Because it seems like from the top down, there's a system in place. Are you, are you happy with that crew? Yeah. So um, basically what we do is we have the race shop at, at our house compound. And um, so the mechanics actually live at the compound. So they're walking distance to the shop which is obviously walking distance from my house. So, um, you know, basically uh, we're together most of the time. I, you know, we all know what each other is doing most all the time, you know what I'm saying? So um, it's good to keep the fingers on the pulse like that and, 
and and it's and, and this way also information doesn't get slipped you know and a mistake that gets made because we're we're all together so um and we're always on it so i feel like uh the system that we have in place is good it's very similar to the system that we had when mike and jeff were racing no nope, not much different i mean it's basically their amateur race shop and amateur program moved into pro racing right makes sense and again you have that experience from them the whole time learning lessons all the way through and now you're doing it at a different level I guess my question would be, because we've talked about this in prior conversations, dealing with Mike and Jeff, they're, they're so different personality-wise, so you had to approach each different. How do you do that now with the this team where you have Brock Tickle and Shane McElrath, Vince Freese, Benny Bloss? These are four individuals they are not all the same, yet you're able to treat each one the way they need to be treated. I mean, is that just you drawing from that experience with Mike and Jeff? Because they were so polar opposite. Is that where you kind of draw from and able to deal with these riders and mechanics that are all so much different personalities? Well, I mean, yeah, that, that definitely aided. It gave me a, like a reference point and some experience with it as well. Um, but for the most part, I do have four riders that are completely different, right? No question. And it not one shoe does not fit all, right? You have to, you have to, you have to mold that shoe per rider. And that's a lot of things, right? It's the bike, it's the program, it's the way that you, talk to them because some guys are pretty sensitive you know and some guys they, they they want you to do that you know they grind them up a little bit and so you have to you have to handle each each guy a little differently to get the best result how okay here's a here's will be a little bit of a tough question and it kind of relates to last night uh eli and vince uh got into it a couple different times and i mean tony you're aware vince has that reputation from the, his career but I feel like he's kind of turned a leaf. I, I haven't seen anything like that in a long time. So even when he gets into it with somebody, people is like, oh, it's Vince, it's Vince. But I felt like he was on the receiving end of, of that stuff last night. And just talk about his kind of development, because you've watched so much of it, just changing from who he was before to who he is now. He still gets the great starts. He's still out front doing his thing. He's still getting better, too. The guy is improving. But he's changed uh, the way he does things. And again, it seems like the reputation is a little bit behind. It's catching up. People are starting to realize that he's changed. But just talk about that and, and, and maybe some of the frustrations when you hear him get called out for things that maybe aren't his fault anymore. Well, I think, um, I mean, I think it was clear that anybody that was watching the race and paying attention to the race, it was, it was definitely clear and it was evident that Vince was riding at the leader's speed. He was fast. He was yeah. not a slow guy. He wasn't blocking. He wasn't holding anybody up last night. He was running that speed. So um, it wasn't like, uh, like Tomac was faster anywhere and, 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 and he ran into him or something. It, it didn't happen that way. Um, Vince, Vince legitimately ran that pace for six laps. Um, if I have to guess, I think that maybe Eli got a little frustrated because he wasn't moving up as quickly as he wanted to. Um, I think that Eli also probably – jumped the gun a little bit you know he 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 tried to force a pass and the reality is you're not forcing a pass on Vince Freeze it's not going to happen it's not going to happen it's not you're going to go you're going to come you're going to come out of that on the losing end you know and it doesn't matter if your name is Eli Tomac or or Alex Ray it doesn't matter um so um I I feel like uh if you noticed, and you did watch last night, I think that Vince's whoop speed is tremendously improved. He was holding his own in the whoops and wasn't losing time to any of the better guys. Um, he never one time resorted to jumping the whoops. Um, so, yeah, I say in general, I think that Vince had six to eighth place speed last night. He was where he belonged. Um, but circumstances just came out that, you know, both guys ended up, you know, creating a bad race for themselves. So they both ended up getting bad results. So, um, because of the circumstances, but I think that, I think that Vince knows now that he's there. He's, he may have arrived, you know, as, as a front guy that can stay there. Are, are you surprised that he's hopped on that 21 model, which obviously is new. There's so much to learn. I mean, I know how much you've developed the 2020. So it, it, it's you guys put years into that. Are you surprised that Vince has been able to hop on that bike and you as a team put this package together and he is able to have that kind of speed right away? Because I saw it at the Madeira Supercross, which we're going to get into. That's, I, dude, I love that so much. But I saw it there that day and I saw it again last night. Like, this is a new bike. There's obviously things to learn. But, I mean, I was really surprised that his speed 
was that good on a, on a model that you guys are still kind of exploring and playing around with? Well, I think it's uh, it was pretty pretty obvious that those 21 Hondas were they were crushing it last night. I mean, we saw how good the Kenny did on his, and obviously um, for me, Vince has moved up you know two three numbers better rider. That bike is is in my mind is is quite good. You know, um, a lot of the things that uh, were maybe not the best on the 20 they've corrected and, and have improved it and uh i think and i think the bike is also up i don't know how to explain it more than that it's more up and that suits vince better you know and so i think all these little pieces together have created a, an ability for him to ride faster I, I mean, I talked to Benny and I talked to Shane that day at the Madera Supercross, and they're super happy with their 2020. So it's not like they're on inferior equipment. But do you are you worried that there will be a time when all of a sudden they start going, "Hey, I, I want a 21." Like, is or is it like set in stone? You guys are going to finish this, or, or is that something you're maybe worried about coming? Because if he keeps riding like that and that bike looks like it does, I, I would say as a rider, there's going to be interest and maybe wanting to move on to it. What, what's what's the plan for that if that happens? Well. I mean, obviously, the guys know that in Supercross, there's a limited supply of material for the 21. So, I mean, between uh, parts and, and bike, it's not even possible. It's not even, it's not even possible to do it. Um, it's a struggle to just do one rider on the 21. It's a struggle. Um, and so, um, I would say zero chance that the other three riders will be on a 21 in Supercross. I would really like the idea of running two 21s in outdoors, just so that we can build a baseline uh, for the future. And I think we we're able to do that better by running 21s in the outdoors. And hopefully by that time, call it May, June, July, there's more material available, more bikes available, and more, we'll be able to do that. You know, Tony, there's a big difference between a factory team and a private team, obviously. And you guys have great support with Honda, great relationship, but it's still so much different. Um, how hard is it from your side when it comes to those resources and parts when you make a brand, or not a brand change, a, a model change like that? Like, I know you're excited about it because you like the bike and you're seeing things that you're like, man, this is great for the future. But when you know that thing's coming and you guys got to make that change, is, is it stressful a little bit knowing like, man, we have really built something good and now we got to start all over or is it okay it's going to be tough but you're excited like is the excitement higher than the nerves or is the nerves higher than the excitement like where are you at when you know a model change is coming um right okay so to begin with i don't i don't really feel like we're at a disadvantage um against the factory teams i think they're in the same boat that we are they have a new model they got to figure it out we have to figure it out it's the same um they're going to learn things we're going to learn things and and obviously together we can make a better bike you know there's there's three teams out here right now on 21s there's uh so i mean together we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna develop and make it better um i always welcome the challenge um the shortfall right now is just a, just a, a lack of supply of even oem parts right so this is not just for us it's for it's for the race team at honda as well um so we have to wait for the supply to come in. Anytime it comes to building, you know, better race parts, it's no different. It's a machine shop, right? So factory Honda will go machine some parts and make some parts. We can do the same thing. Um, normally, what we'll do is uh, sometimes we'll, we'll work together on it. So I don't think there's any big variation. Um, I mean, I think that their budgets are better and they can obviously hire, you know, higher level riders. Um, that's about it about it i mean you guys have proven that in your performances brayton wins daytona uh, malcolm's year last year vince again the, the his progress over the years so you guys have proven that but i just man i i just wonder always how you guys approach that even the, from the factory level when you get a bike and you're like man we got like for cowie right now they're they're loving their bike right now eli's got his bike i mean they're but a new model will come eventually, maybe a year, maybe two years. And it's just such a big challenge. And I always wonder if you guys fear that challenge or if you're like, bring it on. Like we, like, you no, guys it's always, it. it's, we always welcome the challenge. And I think with us having four riders, um, I, if we can get into this thing here a little bit, you know, further, we're going to have more information. It's all information, right? The more information you get, 
the more that you can learn, the more that you can develop, the better the bike gets. So, um, but like I said, right now that 21, I'm not kidding. It's really, really good. And I, like I said, it proved itself last night. You saw Kenny, who was clearly in my mind, the best guy out there. Um, he might not have won the race, but he was definitely on a different level and than, than most. And, and, and Vince, right. Who most people look at as a, you know, a guy outside the top 10, he was definitely running, you know, a six, seven, eight speed, you know, and, uh, I think that's a testament to the bike. As a private team, you talked about the, the resources and the funding, obviously, and the budgets and, su and, and such. Uh, I made a mention of this maybe a month ago in an interview I was on with somebody. I can't remember. But I, I just was so pumped that you put together a four-man team. I mean, you, you see these, like, you know, Gas Gas has one. And every manufacturer is going to do what they think is best. But for you as a private team where funding is so important, what makes you want to have four guys? And, I mean, you're running a huge 450 roster. That costs money. Yeah. But what is it for you personally having that need like to have four? Like you could have had three and been fine. You could have had two, but you wanted four. Money's important. How do you pull it off and why do you want so many riders? Well, I mean, uh, Mike Genova is the team owner, you know, and he is, uh, you know, a big fan of the sport. And he also is in this sport, obviously, to, you know, bring about change and to improve the sport. I mean, clearly, uh, this is his, his, uh, his mission. And so, um, if there are riders that, you know, are obviously available that have, have a decently good level of riding, uh, the opportunity was there, you know? And so, uh, we took the opportunity to hire those guys. When, when Vince has a night like last night, again, it doesn't work out because of the issues with Eli, but you're like, you're stoked, right? With the way he rode, like you're, you're happy. Then Benny has his night where things just, I mean, the guy had issues that were, I mean, you know things that you know are like, man, you're, 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 you're killing my guy here. He didn't have a, even a chance to be himself. I know he's probably bummed. How do you as a team manager deal with someone that has a night like that when things fall apart? Like, are you the kind that likes to maybe lift him up? Or are you the kind that, like, like how do you approach a night when one of your guys has things go wrong and they're just frustrated? Right. So last night, you know, obviously wasn't the best uh, night on paper, but it was a good night, right? So Vince proved that he had speed, that he can run up front. So, I mean, it's always our objective to, to stand the guys up when they're down, right? So we're not going to come in here. I live that other side of the road, by the way, where a guy gets seventh place or fifth place. And you know what? That's just not good enough. And the people around him won't talk to him, won't look at him. We are far from that. You know what I'm saying? I live that on the other side. I know what that feels like on the other side. It's miserable. And so I made a vow that when we run our team and I, and Mike Genova is of the same mindset that we're always going to have a positive vibe at this pit. And, um, you know, we're here to, to enjoy and help and build the program. And so you're not doing any of that stuff if you're beating the guys into the ground, you know? And so, um, Essentially, like uh, last night, I mean, I, I was, I told Vince, I go, there you have it, man. You just arrived. You are now a legitimate top 10 guy. So, you know, and he knows that and he knows he can repeat what he did last night. Um, the one thing I think would help him, and I don't really know how to achieve this really. Um, and he has achieved it with a couple of guys, but those, he has to find a way to get a little bit more respect from some of those top guys, right? I mean, let's be honest. If that whole scenario was going on last night between Eli and Marvin or Eli and Kenny, I don't see that pass happening that Tomac did. I don't see it. But because it was Vince, I just think there's a few guys there in the top 10 that, that look at Vince and they're like, he doesn't belong there. And so, but he's clearly demonstrating that he does belong there. And so it's just going to take a little bit more time to get respect from the guys and, and for them to acknowledge and recognize that he is a top 10 guy and it's coming. So um, in terms of Benny, I mean, let's be real. Benny was fast in his heat race and Benny never gets starts and he got a start in the heat race. He was running up there in top five, top four or five. Um, he actually made a pass on Savachi near the end of the heat race. We were pumped. He was doing great. That was probably one of his best rides. But he fell. 
and so he didn't finish. You know, so that puts him in a bad gate pick for the LCQ. And and to be honest, I think he he panicked a little bit. You know, being in that LCQ it was like you know I didn't have the best gate pick, and it's only what four laps or short, right? And he didn't get a start, and he tried to rush it, and he ran into somebody and fell again, and and um, obviously didn't qualify. You know, so in the case of Benny. Uh, same thing. Like, let's look at what you did tonight. You are, you have improved your starts. You have speed. I mean, Savachi is not a slow guy. He's a, he's for sure right at the top ten mark. And you were you're faster than him. So that tells you that you're you're a fast guy. So again, you just got to build these guys up and let's come back again uh, on Tuesday and and try to get the results that we're we're capable of. So, Tony, I'm going to steer this thing now off of dirt bikes a little bit. So, obviously, you work all day. We, we just we bleed this stuff all day, right? I, I do it. You do it. We all do it. But I have things in life that I like outside of racing. I love football. Um, I actually like psychology. I read psychology books. It's like a weird little hobby of mine. For you, when you do break away and you get a minute for some of this Tony time, what, like what do you like outside of this? There's a, you, you can't tell me it's just this only. There's something else. What, what, what out there hobby-wise or interest-wise uh, you got going on when, when you can shut the dirt bike stuff off? I might have tunnel vision. You know, uh, <laughs> I have those little girls of mine at home, and I honestly, I take them riding, you know? <laughs> so when I have my, my little bit of free time, they're on their Stasics. Uh, they're getting closer and closer to riding those PWs. They ride their bicycles. They ride their – they're I just like to take them riding you know and and for the littler ones I put them on like I have a a little play bike and I take them riding you know like now like now when I get home it's like one of them is like take me riding in the mountains because there's a gully track over by my house so yeah I mean I that's what I enjoy how, how different is it for you I mean you had Mike and Jeff it was just it was competitive it was a a program and now you're doing this again a second chapter of being a dad but you got these little girls obviously they're gonna ride because it's in the blood it's a but how much different are you now as a dad in this second in this second wave of fatherhood with with these little girls yeah it's completely different right I mean you know like Mike was so competitive when he was a little kid like if Jeff beat him even in, in something as simple as pool like playing the pool table game and if Jeff beat Mike Jeff would get whacked in the head or something in the back by Mike with the pool stick for beating him. It was, it was really bad. Um, the girls are, uh, uh, I don't think they're as, I mean, they're, they are competitive in their ways, you know what I'm saying? Um, but they're girls and they're, they're different. They have like feelings and they, they will cry. If you say the wrong thing, it's a little different, you know? So, um, yeah, it's, it's I'm learning, still learning that. Tony, you know, those girls are going to be teenagers someday. Are you ready for that? Because I, I have a daughter. She's seven right now. She's my baby. She's my sweetheart. And I know what's coming here in a couple of years. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And you're going to have four. What are you going yeah, to Yeah, I have one. And I can see already how it's going to go, right? Because you can kind of see their personalities already. So I have one that's just really smart. I can see she's going to be smarter than me. And that's going to be a challenge. And then I've got one that's really sassy. And then I got one that's really tough. And I, the new one I have, I don't know how that's going to go yet. But, uh, yeah, I'm going to have my hands full. You'll have a fourth personality, too, because they're, the world's not going to let you have two that are the same. So you actually have a playbook. You're going to have to do a new playbook and then a new playbook and a new yeah. playbook. And like you said, I, I'm with you. The smart ones are the ones you got to worry about because then you think you got a leg up and they're just playing you the whole time. Like, I, yeah. I'm worried about my daughter's smart, too. She's street smart. She plays me already, and she's seven. I know I'm in big trouble. I've said it under my breath a couple of times. I'm like, oh, my gosh, she's smarter than me. I'm like, <laughs> oh, man, I'm kind of have my hands full with this one. Yeah. Hey, what about uh, Mike? So I, I, I got to bring Mike up. I saw uh, Danielle posted a video on Instagram today, and I, and I really liked it. I don't know if you saw it, but Mike was on the starting gate uh, at the arena cross. I think it was probably last night with the 50 kids and just giving a knuckle punch and giving a knuckle punch to all the kids and going through the starting gate. Is that cool for you to see that kind of stuff and see Mike now growing up as, as a, you know, a man in his thirties and being able to kind of give back to those kids and, and, and give them a little bit of love. You know, is that something that you're proud of when you see that? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, for the both for the most part, both of those guys, Mike and Jeff, they've always been good with the kids. Always, you know, even when they were mini bike racers. I mean, they never brought trophies home, right? So they would win these big, massive six foot trophies, and they would sign their name and go find the kid over there that didn't get a trophy and hand them the trophy. Say, here you go, bud. And that didn't come from anything except for them. That was what they wanted to do. They loved it. Um, it's obviously carried on. I mean, I mean, you know, Daniel, once you're a racer, you're always a racer. That's why Mike's racing. He enjoys it, you know? Um, I mean, he, I'd say he's pretty set from his career already, you know? He, he lives in Florida, and he's pretty set. But, I mean, he likes to go ride and race his dirt bike, and he's capable, right? He's still fit. Um, he still enjoys it. Um, I mean, it, I'm sure that he wouldn't enjoy it if he had to do what we have to do. This is a lot of pressure and stressful and you got to do the quad out of the corner and you got to hit the whoops that are giant. I mean, maybe that is not so much fun. You know what I'm saying? But to go race arena cross or go do a Loretta Lynn race or a regional or do the two stroke national or, or go do a vet world championship that's enjoyable, right? He doesn't have to put it all out there, you know, like risk it all. And uh, he doesn't have to like, you know, do eight hours of fitness work and, 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 and watch every little thing that he eats to be able to participate. Because let's be honest, those, those are the things in the grind that make it not fun, right? right. Having to stick to the diet and, and having to do the training and having to do the motos. And then you get to the race and you, you have to risk it all. Not fun. But yeah, he's been through that, right? He's been huh? through that. He already went through all that. He did it all. He's made a good living. And now he's racing races that he wants to race, that he enjoys racing. Um, I think he's got some races on the schedule uh, for two stroke races. Uh, the one he likes to ride that 125. He, he just, he's riding all the races that he likes. And he's not taking a lot of risk. And he's racing for the joy of racing and kudos to him right yeah I, I mean, when i saw that he was doing arena cross i i do the i do the tv for, work for that so i was just like yes like mike's back racing and i mean it makes arena cross that much more fun when you get a name like that in there to battle with the guys and um my my follow-up question to that is you, you know how some days you're you get a little bit of free time you get to go through your instagram and really see what's going on but then there's some days where you just kind of breeze through and you'll see something, but you don't really dive in. I saw a photo of you guys. I don't know if were you on like a private jet or what were you doing, but I, I know you were at the first round. I didn't, I didn't get enough. To, I didn't get enough time to go into that, but what was that? Like what, tell me about what happened there. I think it was the opening round, right? So I was going to go to the opening round. I was basically just going to take a regular plane just to go to Memphis and drive a few hours. And then um, one of uh, the team's sponsors um, was like, Hey, uh, Mike French, right? Good guy. Got a family, two girls that ride dirt bikes. Uh, his wife is a, uh, she rents the, um, she rents, rents like equipment rental. She has skid steers and all that. She actually drives a truck. It's cool. Um, and he was like, oh, I want to go to Mike's race too. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll, I'll see you there. He's like, no, no, no. Fly to Dallas. I got my plane. We can fly right to Starkville. We can get there in 40 minutes. We'll land, we'll get off the plane, and we'll be at the track in like 10 minutes. So I'm like, all right, cool, let's do it. So I flew over to Dallas, and um, yeah, we just got on this. I mean, it was, I mean, really, that kind of travel is amazing, right? It's like uh, a flying Uber, right? Yeah. You, you, you don't have to go check any bag, show any ID, you don't got to do nothing. You just basically walk in here, and, and in two minutes, you're on the plane, and then you're in the air. It's like, what? This is crazy. I mean, we've literally, when the race was over on Saturday night, race was over at 930. We were literally in the air in 20 minutes from the time that the race was over. And we were back landing in Dallas, you know, less than an hour later. It was cool. And, and uh, was the girl, his whole family enjoyed the whole thing. And it was, uh, it was a good time. Was Jeff, was Jeff there too? Yeah, yeah. Jeff went. Um, I figured, you know, I have a companion pass on Southwest, so I flew we flew together to Dallas, and then we both jumped in his plane, and, and away we went. And you know, Jeff hasn't been to a race with Mike, and I can't even remember how many years it's been. So, so he enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, we, and it was good. You know, I I I've got I don't get to spend that much time with Jeff. He comes 
and he does classes, you know, like um, riding classes. And he does them, you know, behind my house up in, up like in the canyon. And so I try to see him when he's doing that. But for the most part, I don't get to see him that much because I'm either at the track with the riders or, you know, I'm out with the girls. So I don't get to see him that much, you know. And so it was good to spend, you know, better part of three days, you know. Oops. You still there? Yep, we're here. We're good. Yeah. It was cool to spend the better part of about three days with him. So that was awesome. How was that being at the races with Mike and Jeff and Tony? Just you guys, uh, you three again. Well, I can tell you this. Jeff is like, after we went to that arena cross, he's like, I can do it. I can do it. Go <laughs> Get me a bike. Let me let me go do that. So now he wants to go back and race, go back to racing. He's you know he's still pretty. He's an excellent rider, right? You know, so he probably could do it. You know, but it was good. It was fun to be all back together. No, though, if Jeff got going and got himself a little in shape, got going and went to arena cross with Mike, well, he might beat him actually. You know, Jeff Jeff pretty fast going through the whoops. He might beat him. And how would Mike handle that? Pull stick over the head. No, he would just he would just work harder. Is what he would do. <laughs> so the so those young days of of smacking each other around are done now. Now that they're growing up and no, and, I don't think so. I mean, I think that that old rivalry would just come right on back again. I don't think that Mike's gonna let him beat him very very often. You know, if it happened once, if it happened twice, he's not gonna let it happen again. You know, it yeah. it would be all that again. But no, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll get one more question for you. I want to bring up the dinner thing again. I had a chance to go last year, Anaheim won, to the team dinner. It's something that's very important to you. I know that. Um, and that, my question will be why. But you get the whole team together. Everybody's there. It's, and it's not like you're at this table and you're at this table. I mean, you make the whole team together. That way there's this unity thing. What's the method behind that other than just the, the natural camaraderie thing? But is there something else to that in making sure everybody's on the same page? I, and I know that dinner is so important to you. So um, obviously Mike Genova, team owner, this is a very, um, you know, structured, almost a business kind of meeting. Like it's, uh, you know, the night before the race, we want to know where the mechanics are. We want to know where the riders are. And we want to discuss topics that are going on, you know, before, during, after the race. It's a good opportunity to bring all that stuff to the table. And it's, and it's really, there's no more important time than actually now, because we're in a, a time of a lot of change going on. So those, those dinner meetings are actually become even more important. Um, um, it's just an opportunity to break bread and the, everybody on our team, the riders, uh, the mechanics, the sponsors that are, are there, the media people, they all have their opportunity to speak and they're actually required to speak, right? And, um, and it just helps, you know, it just helps uh, the synergy between everybody. And, and um, I think everybody is more united and then, and, and there's more thoughts and ideas that are kind of, you know, put together. I think it, it, it turns out to be, you know, a great night for everybody. And like I said, I mean, if you're a rider, right, you kind of want to know where your mechanic was the night before the race, right? And you can go, yep, he was right there, right? And so, uh, yeah. So. Hey, you made me even stand up and speak when I went last year. I was like, ha. Ah. I don't even know what to say, but and I got, I don't know if you remember, but I got there late. I was coming from production meetings. So everyone's already done their thing. And I get in there and you're like, Daniel, stand up. It's your turn to talk. And I'm like, what do I say? You're like, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? And I, I did. I always remember that. I thought it was fun. And again, it, it was a little bit like I wasn't ready for it. But then once I did it and I realized that's what the team did, I was like, okay, okay. I got it. But did the writers ever push back on that and be like, I don't want to say anything. Well, I mean, for the most part, right? 90%, we don't have any problem. We might have had a little hiccup with that last year, which I think it's probably easy for you to figure out. Um, but for the most part, you know, um, we feel like uh, our, our group is a very united group and they, they all want to contribute and they all want to be a part of it. And so, um, yeah, I mean, no problems like for this year at all that I see. Right on. Well, hey, thanks for the time. Again, it's Tony time. Tony needs his time, and we stole it from you. And I know you don't mind because I know you're 24-7 with this stuff. So uh, well, I'm going to let you get back to work. I know you got things to do before Tuesday. And, uh, again, thanks for joining me on Beyond the Track. Always a pleasure. Thanks a lot, Daniel. Thanks.